Hi and welcome back. I know it's been a little while. So in this video, I share an extract from my interview with Dr. Eric Gordon from the upcoming free online summit titled Cracking the Chronic Illness Code that runs from May 6th to the 12th. In this short extract, I discuss how we're going to get to a place where your GP can actually offer you effective treatment for long COVID, what the latest research and trials are on the subject of viral persistence, and just how into that picture long COVID symptoms triggered by the vaccine fit in. I'll talk some more about the summit and how I've been getting on my own journey after this extract. Hope you find it interesting. Probably we should talk a little bit about what you've seen about how there's the similarities are these things appeared after after you had COVID or after a vaccine, but the, there's a lot of differences amongst people who have these symptoms. So maybe we should start there. What I think the most important work that's being done at the moment is in characterizing the condition. And when I say characterizing it, I mean creating a diagnostic test. So what does this mean? This means we are trying to establish a given set of biomarkers that can illustrate whether somebody has long COVID? And if so, what kind of long COVID is it? Because there are two, over 200 recognized symptoms for, for the condition. No single person is likely to have all 200. It's a kaleidoscope okay. and every two people are different. So how is that gonna look? Because ultimately what we want to be able to do is to get to a position where, you know, person A can walk in to see their primary care physician, that physician can take some blood or do a test of some description, come back and say, okay, you've got long COVID type A. And to treat long COVID type A, we use, you know, procedures, treatments, whatever, A, B, and C. Someone else will go in and he'll say, you've got long COVID type B. You need, you know, drugs, <laughs> pharmacological interventions or whatever, B, C, D, and F. So one of the most important things at the moment is actually in, in phenotyping. So that is about trying to establish what the groupings are, not just of long COVID symptoms, but more importantly, pathologies. What are the pathologies that are driving each of these clusters of symptoms? And then how do we treat each of those pathologies in a way that you know gets rid of the condition, gets rid of the downstream effects? Now, where it gets really complicated is that we have multiple pathologies, each of which have potentially overlapping symptoms. So just because somebody presents with symptoms A, B, C, and D doesn't necessarily by itself tell us exactly what's going on with them. And this is why, whilst we understand that there may be certain pathologies which are likely to lead to certain symptoms, we can't definitively nail that down until we've got those biomarkers agreed, um, discovered, agreed, consensus, and we have a set of phenotypes established that actually enable us to then do the correct treatment trials for, because if you take the wrong phenotype and treat them with a treatment that might work for a different phenotype, then you're going to get negative results. And everybody will put their hands up and say, this antiviral treatment, for example, doesn't work. Well, you didn't treat the right people. You didn't treat the people who had viral persistence. You treated the autoimmunity people or whatever. So, so this is for me, one of the biggest hurdles to overcome quickly um, as quickly as we can, because this is fundamentally going to change the way that we do research and ultimately provide care to patients. I know you've talked to a lot of different researchers about the issues of viral persistence, because that was a big thing, because, you know, the medical community at large had this feeling that um, RNA, there's no such thing as persistent RNA viruses. And despite the few researchers here and there who were talking about it with measles or stuff, you asked a doctor, that didn't happen. And, yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. That's what the prevailing understanding was. However, right. right so let me just quote uh, a paragraph from an excellent paper by uh, Hannah Davis et al., which was published in Nature Reviews Microbiology. I'm just going to quote this paragraph because it sums up our current evidence base for viral persistence in long COVID. So viral proteins and or RNA has been found in the reproductive system, cardiovascular system, brain, muscles, eyes, lymph nodes, appendix, breast tissue, hep hepatic tissue, lung tissue, plasma, stool, and urine across many different studies. In one particular study, circulating spike antigen was found in 60% of patients with long COVID up to 12 months after diagnosis, compared to none of 26 SARS-CoV-2 infected individuals, likely implying a reservoir of active virus or components of the virus. Indeed, multiple reports following gastrointestinal biopsies where they've cut sections of the gut out 
have indicated the presence of virus suggestive of a persistent reservoir in some patients. So that's an overview of the science that's out there. None of it is quite a smoking gun, but we've got so much evidence of the remains of this virus being in all sorts of places it shouldn't be. And then we've also got multiple papers uh, which are showing that there is a degree of T-cell exhaustion as well. So papers looking at the immunology of patients have found that their immune cells um, are basically not running as they should. And why would these T-cells be looking, inverted commas, exhausted? Well, because they've basically been fighting a persistent antigen for a long time. So again, we've got more and more of this weight of evidence that is pointing in the direction of viral persistence. But there are some big questions, I think, still remaining here, which are how many uh, long haulers have a persistent reservoir of virus? Is it 10%, 50%, 90%? Another really important question is, do recovered patients who do not have long COVID, so people who just had a COVID infection and got better, did they have a what proportion of them, of them have a persistent reservoir of virus too? Because it's quite possible they do. And so is it just the body's response to this persistent virus that's creating the vicious cycle that we see as long COVID symptoms? And if you think about those questions, it gives us a couple more, <laughs> a couple more thoughts to go on from that, which is, okay, so we want to make people better. Do we try and remove the viral reservoir? If so, how do we do that? Or B, remove the reaction to it? And either one of those might be a way forward, or both of those might be required. But in any, and in some ways, removing the reservoir is simpler because it's upstream. If you try and remove the reaction to it, then you have to understand what that reaction might be. And this is where I tap into a bunch of the other pathologies that we are documenting as finding in long COVID patients, including things like autoimmunity, microclots or blood abnormality, uh, mast cell activation syndrome, general inflammation and its mu immune disruption, reactivated latent viruses, so that's things like EBV and herpes viruses, microbiome disruption, uh, metabolic dysfunction, and dysautonomia, right? So all of this stuff is going on. A bunch of those other pathologies are linked and feeding into each other. And this is why the condition is so heinously complex. At the top of it might, and I say might, be sitting viral persistence, but it might actually be a, a curveball that's sending us in the wrong direction. Because if you look at the patients who are suffering with long COVID-like symptoms after vaccination, well, unless they'd previously had a, um, a symptomless uh, COVID infection, it's unlikely that they're suffering from viral persistence. They're possibly just suffering from persistence of spike. So there's another line into this that suggests how important is it to go after the virus or how important is it to go after these other pathologies? So it's an incredibly complex subject. And I think we almost need to crack it to understand the best way forwards. I'll, I'll just sort of segue then into what research is happening at the moment um, in terms of dealing with SARS-CoV-2 persistence. So mm. Paxlovid is being looked into because it's been established at dealing with acute, yep. uh, acute COVID. And the trials for Paxlovid are tending to look at a slightly longer course because we might need to look at 10 or 15 day courses versus the five that you would normally have on an yeah. acute. Uh, or, you know. or, or maybe even if it's working, maybe even a lot longer, if anything, if our experience so, with the DNA so, viruses. And, and, what, and what we're hearing is that people feel better whilst they're on it. A proportion of people feel better yeah. whilst they're taking it. And then when they stop, <laughs> the symptoms come back. Um, right. Now, we're still waiting on, there was a big trial on Paxlovid that got paused because I think they were looking into some of the methodology on it. And there was a big hoo-ha in the community. This shows it doesn't work. I don't think we're quite there yet. We're still waiting on the results of those. Something that's quite interesting in the UK is we've had a, a £1.2 million pound study uh, funded recently at the University of Derby. It's a doctor called Mark uh, Fahey, and he's looking at remdesivir. And so they're going to be taking long haulers who've been suffering for two years or more and treating them over a nine-month period. So I'm really excited to see what comes out of that study, uh, because that's one of the first studies in the UK. I think it might be the first study in the UK that I've heard of that's actually looking directly into treatment in quite this way. Um, and, and then something else I heard about recently that's interesting, but this comes from, I have to point out, the lowest quality of evidence that you could possibly imagine, which is a Facebook support group, anecdotal reports from a Facebook support group. But this is kind of where it starts. So people on 
long COVID Facebook support groups are trying a drug called cycloferon, which is a, a Russian uh, interferon producer, essentially. It encourages the interferons, which are, again, part of the body's immune system. And it's usually used to treat things like flu and uh, viral pneumonias. Um, and the reports on uh, on these Facebook support groups have been quite positive. People saying, yes, this has led to complete remission. We've also had, again, these are a hand, this is like the lowest possible evidence base. I do, I just have to say that for the fourth time. Um, <laughs> but this is the sort of thing I would like to see in a big trial, right? Why not, if we're going to have a moonshot on this stuff, let's throw that stuff in there. There's a logic and a rationale why it would work. Monoclonal antibodies, we've just had a tiny sample reported yeah. there as well. So again, this is directly going after an infection with these monoclonal antibodies and complete remission in the two or three people that were treated. So I hope you found that brief extract interesting. If you'd like to sign up for the free online summit that this interview is part of, then there are some links in the description. It runs from the 6th to the 12th of May, and there are some really great speakers, so I definitely do recommend it. Just for reference, it's free to watch live during the period of the summit itself, but if you want to save any of the content or watch it subsequently on Catch Up, then you can have full unlimited eternal access for $99. If that's of interest to you, then using the links in the description will give me a small kicker. So I'd like to extend my great appreciation if that's what you choose to do. Changing the subject, I've had some people asking how I've been doing, as I've been somewhat absent from social media for a bit. So I posted a series of tweets um, about a break I took at the end of last year going out to Cyprus, and the idea was that I was basically going to be doing six weeks radical rest. And on top of that, I did some hyperbaric oxygen therapy um, and a few IVs. And the idea, I think, was how can I just give myself a little boost at the same time as putting together a protracted period of basically radical rest. And how much difference is that going to make to my symptoms? Um, and it was quite an interesting experience. So just to sort of fill you in on, on how it went, I was quite surprised to find that rest didn't actually diminish the number of bad days I had. So I basically, over that six weeks period, I had as many sort of crashy days as I would have normally done at home. And at first I was a bit disappointed about that. But then after a little bit of thought, I was like, actually, you know, that there's some positives to take out of it. Firstly, there's nothing particularly wrong in my home environment that's causing my symptoms to get worse. And equally, the pacing that I'm doing in my home environment and the amount of work I was doing wasn't fundamentally crashing me any harder than the condition was by itself. So there were two positive things to take out of that. And the other thing that I got a chance to do a bit of thinking about was actually how I spend my limited time and energy. And that's one of the reasons why I've been a little bit less prominent on YouTube and on social media, because I'm deciding to sort of focus on a couple of things that can actually sustain me and give me the best chance of recovery. So I will be posting a little bit more on YouTube over the coming weeks and months, but not hugely. So I apologise in advance for my continued moderate absence. Uh, but of course, I do wish everybody a very speedy recovery because we are still hearing about first waivers recovering um, and I do hope that that is in all of our futures sooner rather than later. So look after yourselves until next time.